Good afternoon, Facebook. Uh, my name is Ian Cross. I am the uh, digital executive producer here at News 5. Uh, I am joined today, and actually, let me just switch my camera here. <laughs> okay. I am joined today by Dr. Tara Smith. She is an uh, epidemiologist and infectious disease expert at Kent State University. Good afternoon, Dr. Smith. Good afternoon, and thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, thank you for so much for taking the time to talk to us uh, and our Facebook audience today. Um, I, as you can tell, I'm usually not geared up for being an on-camera guy. I, I'm usually the, the digital guy behind the scenes. But you know, in, in reporting on this virus over the last few months, um, you know, one thing that I've I've found is that our Facebook audience is is very engaged. Uh, you know, on on this disease, and and they are you know not shy about you know letting us know how they feel and, and letting us know how they feel about our reporting and and you know the stuff that we're putting out fairly regularly. And they have lots of questions. Uh, they have lots of questions, and they they hear lots of other things that, that we're not reporting on. And um, so, you know, the, the purpose of this Facebook Live is to give you a chance to kind of address some of those, you know, some of that information, you know, kind of sort out what's real, what's not, um, you know, what, what is fact-based and, and what is a scientist, you know, you, you go by and, and what not. Um, so, you know, before we even started, we already got some questions on our, on our live stream, so uh, I can definitely get to some of those. But, um, you know, before I be begin with that, I kind of wanted to go over kind of some of the, some of the myths that we've already talked about in our, in our interview previously. Um, and something that you know comes up fairly familiar on our Facebook page. So, uh, first things first, you know, now that testing has gone up in Ohio, now that we are testing, you know, record number of people, you know, every single day, um, I think one thing that people see is, uh, you know, those those positive case numbers go up, and so the first thing that they they assume, and you know, per perhaps to some degree, rightly so, is you know, more testing. That's the reason why we're getting more positive tests is because there are more people, more testing available, more people able to test. Uh, so can you maybe speak to that and, and, you know, kind of explain what's going on there? Right, sure. So part of it is, of course, yes, that that's, as we test more people, we will see more positives. But how we can kind of disentangle whether that is only due to that aspect is by looking at the percent positives. So if you have the same number of people that are infected, but you're testing more as we are today, then what you would expect is that our percent positives, instead of holding steady, would actually go down because we have a larger denominator. What we're seeing instead is that our percent positive is actually going up. So um, that does mean that there actually is more community spread. There is more, uh, there are more positive cases out there. And in some cases, we're actually not testing enough. We want to keep our percent positive under 5%. And right now, last I checked, maybe even higher today, but it was at about 7%. So, so we're actually a little bit high and we should actually be testing more to really capture all of those cases out there. Yeah, great. I mean, the, the way I look at it, I don't know if this analogy is apt, but it's like, and how I understand it is I have a, you know, two shots of alcohol and, you know, a smaller glass and a big glass. And if, if you put the same shot of alcohol in the big glass and a small glass, then the big glass is going to have a, a lower, you know, APV. So that if, if, you know, if, you know, if it was the same size of, of alcohol in each glass, then, um, you know, the, the, the percent alcohol would be, would be, uh, you know, lower, right? Which right. isn't it's the same amount. <laughs> Uh, is, that, is that a pretty good analogy? I'll have to keep that in mind for the drinkers and in, in the audience. You know, I'm in quarantine, you know, what I do when I get off work. Right. Uh, great. Well, we've actually got some good questions coming in already, so maybe I'll just jump on some of those. Um, so J Jessalyn Trude, and this is a long one, so I have to get my head above it here. Uh, can you ask her about asymptomatic children returning to school? Um, the whole, uh, if you're sick today, doesn't uh, sick home today doesn't apply to someone, not showing the illness. So how can we make sure to keep our kids safe if an asymptomatic child returns and has a possibility of spreading COVID unintentionally? Yeah, and that's one of the big, big gaps as far as our school plans is that um, for most areas, they have no plans to test or even if they wanted to, they couldn't because of expense and because of just, um, you know, the difficulty of, of getting those tests and getting them turned around in a quick enough time to really prevent additional spread. So that is one reason why many in public health have been hesitant to recommend completely reopening schools because they there can be kids who are either completely asymptomatic and never show symptoms but may still be able to spread that virus or those who are in the pre-symptomatic phase. So they will show symptoms, but it won't be for a couple days. But in the meantime, they're at school with their friends there and they could be spreading the virus in that point. And by doing things that are recommended like um, temperature checks and things like that, or having parents attest that their children have no symptoms, 
those are not particularly helpful um, to prevent spread in that case. So that is why, you know, for, for those who are sending children back or for schools who are planning to have children in, in person, that's really why we recommend universal masking. Um, it won't prevent spread 100% but it can reduce that and again, keep that virus within the mask and not spread to, to friends and, and to teachers that are in the room. Great. Yeah, and actually speaking of masking, I think that's another thing that we're seeing a lot of, you know, per potential misinformation about. I think a lot of people have questions about masking and, you know, one thing that comes up is, well, you know, the CDC said no masks at the beginning of this thing and now they are saying masks. So can you maybe speak to, you know, wh what happened and, and, you know, maybe what they were originally saying too. Uh, can you right. That? Yeah, so um, so the original message was was no masks for kind of the average person. But it's always been if you are sick to stay home and to wear a mask if you're going to be around somebody who is healthy. So say you're you're sick at home, but um, your spouse perhaps is taking care of you, then you should wear a mask when you are around your spouse or your caregiver. So we did that because the masks work relatively well as what we call source control. So again, keeping that virus that you could be expelling if you were sick and you're coughing or sneezing or things like that, keeping that inside the mask and away from the person who is healthy. Um, so what has changed since then is that we had assumed that this novel virus would be somewhat like SARS and MERS, which are the previous epidemic coronaviruses that we've dealt with. And those really only spread when people have symptoms. So, um, so you didn't need a mask to prevent spread because you could just isolate the people who were ill. What we found since then is, again, just as I talked about, that these can spread for several days before you develop symptoms. So that's why we have moved from only masking for those who are ill to masking for everybody because those people could be out in the community, could be interacting with others, and could be spreading the virus before they become ill and before they realize they're infected. So that's why the move to universal masking. Great. Um, an interesting question from uh, Darlene May, and I'm not sure, you know, I, I actually hadn't heard this, but maybe you can speak to it. Uh, when can we expect an FDA approved test? Not pending approval. So I don't know. If uh -oh. you know. Yeah, good question. And um, I am not in that kind of area. Um, so most of what we're using right now are, are being used under an emergency use authorization. So basically the FDA is saying, you know, okay, you gave us a little bit of data. We need a test right now. And so those are being used. Um, but I don't know about the pipeline as, as far as where any of those are for any kind of final approval. Yeah, I'm not sure. Sorry. No, that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. Next question. And this is one we talked about earlier. Can you get COVID-19 twice? Yeah, and we don't know. Um, so there have been a number of reports of people who have been reinfected. Um, and some of those seem to be people who maybe were not actually reinfected, but they tested positive after having a negative test. And so that could be just an aspect of the testing itself, that the virus can linger in your nose or throat for quite some time, and the test is very sensitive and it can pick up um, live or dead virus. So if it lingers in your nose or throat for weeks or months, you could potentially test, um, test positive even after you feel well. But then there have also been reports of people who seemingly have recovered, who were positive, who were very ill, who then, you know, got well, seemed to be somewhat back to normal, and then became ill again and tested positive again. So those are the ones we're really not sure about. And um, I've mostly seen those presented in, you know, in the news media and not in a scientific journal yet. So we don't have all of, you know, at least from a scientific standpoint, uh, I don't have all of the information to really look at um, what this person went through, how they were tested, how they were diagnosed to really know for sure if they are, are presenting with um, with COVID-19 twice or not. So it's a maybe right now. It's, and it's something that is a very active area of investigation. And lots of people are definitely concerned about that. Great. Another question that we've uh, we talked about previously as well, and, and I think a very mm -hmm. pertinent one, um, could you explain why herd immunity won't apply with COVID? Yeah, and we're we're still figuring that out. So, um, so I mentioned earlier that we determine the level of herd immunity in a population by looking at the transmissibility of the virus. And so in this case with um, SARS coronavirus 2, you would need to have somewhere between 60 and 70% of the population who is immune um, in order to really stop the spread of this virus or at least slow it down below um, to an, an, an endemic level. Um, but some of the things we don't know right now are if 
that immunity is really long term enough to protect you at the population level. So if immunity only lasts a few months, then those people who were already reinfected, who are already infected, say now, by December, they may no longer be immune, they may no longer be protected. So trying to get a level of 60 to 70% of the population that is immune to this, if immunity is short term, we're never going to reach that. Um, and even if we do reach that, that comes with a lot of sacrifices. So right now, of course, we've lost almost 140,000 people in the United States alone to this virus, and we're not anywhere close to herd immunity. So to get to that level, you would have to have you know many deaths um, to to reach that, if it even would work at all. So um, I don't think herd immunity is is the way that we're going to get out of this, at least by um, herd immunity via natural infection. Yeah, I mean, herd immunity would apply, but only once a vaccine is found and once, you know, a certain percent right. of people, you know. Great. Um, well, some great questions so far. And, and if you're just joining us, I just want to, you know, let everyone know we're, we're joined today with uh, Dr. Tara Smith. She's an epidemiologist and infectious disease expert from Kent State University answering your questions and, you know, busting COVID-19 myths, uh, you know, hopefully. <laughs> uh, so if you do have a question, if you have a concern, if there's a, you know, uh, something that you read that you're not sure about that you want, you know, uh, Dr. Smith to kind of weigh in on and provide, you know, some kind of, you know, some scientific background on, then uh, by all means, please do. Because uh, mm -hmm. we'll, be, we'll be at this for, for a little bit longer, um, you know, as long as we continue getting questions from you guys. Um, good question here from Amanda, uh, Krista Fays. Uh, what is the state of Ohio testing? Should it be increased if we are sending kids back to school? Uh, you know, right now she says, I can't get a test mm -hmm. if I, you're in, asymptomatic, which I think is, is true in some areas, but then it really depends on where you go, right? I mean, there's some places yeah. where are testing anyone who, who comes and, and other areas that are kind of limiting them? Right, and so it, it, it really depends. Um, so, uh, it, unfortunately, there's, there's nothing I, I can, as far as I understand, that really applies statewide. Um, so, most areas are still testing people who only have symptoms. Um, some areas, as I understand it, Columbus seems to be a little bit better at this than maybe we are here in, in Northeast Ohio as far as getting more people in and getting a rapid turnaround of tests. But it seems um, that we, at least here in, in this area, maybe kind of at our, um, at our limit for, for testing. Um, as far as I understand, the turnaround right now is slower um, to get those results back. Um, and the, we're, we're just not testing as rapidly as we were before. Um, in Ohio, or, I'm sorry, in, in the Columbus area, I know Ohio State has become involved with some of this and are doing some testing there. I know they're doing some testing of um, like student athletes that are coming back. They've, that's how they found some cases already. So they have done some testing of asymptomatic individuals there at least um, as they come on campus. But I don't know the availability of um, tests in really any area for those who are completely asymptomatic. Um, lots of times they are moving back to limiting them to people who are um, who are ill only. So I would say you know we still don't have the testing that that we need. Um, we were doing better than 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 we were in April and May. Certainly we have a lot more tests available now and and a lot um, we've tested over a million people since the beginning of the epidemic. But Ohio still lingers toward the bottom of some of that testing. Um, nationwide. We're, we're still not where we should be. Gotcha. Sorry about my dog there. No. He, wanted join, he wanted to join the interview too. <laughs> um, great. Well, and this is another one that comes up frequently. Pretty much every time we report, you know, the number of, of new cases, um, Jennifer <laughs> Lee asks, uh, what about one being person being tested multiple times and each test counting towards the number of positive multiple times? Um, you know, she questions whether that's the reason for the inflating numbers. Mm -hmm. And you know, I won't say that that's never happened, but um, you know, for the most part, individuals are, are reported as a case. Um, sometimes people will have to get multiple tests, like if they, um, you know, need to go back to work and, and need a negative test to show that they are no longer infectious. They may have multiple positive tests until they get to that negative test, but they will be reported as a case and not as all of those multiple positive tests. So. Um, you know, so again, I can't 100% say that has never happened, but that is not again what is what is the re or what is the reason for our increasing numbers here is that people are getting tested multiple times. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for that. And, and this is another one that I, I've seen bubbling up in in various places, kind of talking about masks. And I and you know we had talked earlier about why it's, it's so important that. Um, 
you know, there's not misconceptions around masking. Um, but um, Alita Schrader says the virus is 0 0.03 microns. Uh, holds on cotton are like 110 microns. Uh, isn't that like blowing the wall off your home and sending a hamster through? Mm -hmm. now right. you, maybe you can speak to why you know that is or isn't uh, the case. Right. Well, so a hamster can locomote. I mean, a hamster can move by itself, and viruses cannot. So viruses are dependent on um, you know propulsion through air and, and things like that. And so what we're doing with masking um, is one prov providing a barrier to help prevent um, the the droplets that carry those viruses and help prevent them from leaving the mask. So when you are, are wearing a mask, and again, the best ones are generally triple layer with a, a tight weave. So you have um, and those overlapping um, layers of, of fabric to try to keep all of your respiratory droplets in rather than leaving the mask. Um, what you're doing is keeping those droplets in and those droplets hold the virus. So as long as you can keep those droplets in the mask, very little of that virus is going to get out. And then if two people are masked, then you have that double protection. So not only is the virus going to stay in your mask in those droplets, but the other person is gonna be more difficult for any you know, potential free floating aerosolized virus to get in and expose them to the virus. So that's why again, we recommend it universally. Um, they protect you, you protect them. And between the two of you, that virus should really be maintained within those masks. Very good. Yeah. And, and um, you know, I think there there are lots of various versions of that, you know, of mm -hmm. that information where it's like, well, you know, it's it's only a certain amount. But I think, you know, as, as you say, when, when everyone's wearing a mask, it's, it's that double layer of protection. And um, right. let me move on. Um, and this is great. Another question that, that we had talked about uh, mm -hmm. before that lots of people have questions about and, and rightly yeah. so as school is coming up, can children get COVID and can they spread it to others? I appreciate kind of the simplicity of that question. I, I think it's a lot to talk <laughs> yes. about. And the answer is yes and yes. Um, but there are gray areas there, right? So children can get COVID. Um, we have had some, some deaths of children from this, um, but overall as a population, they do seem to be less susceptible to getting, um, to becoming symptomatic at all, even with mild symptoms. And they less commonly get serious symptoms than adults in, in older population groups do. So, um, so they definitely can get it, but um, it tends to be less serious. And spreading it to others, um, it, they also seem to spread it less frequently than, again, than adult groups do. Um, but they can spread it to others. We've seen some outbreaks already associated with schools and daycares um, in South Korea, in Israel, and even in, in Texas here in the United States. Um, so they can transmit it, they can get it, but as far as we can tell so far, keeping in mind that children have not been in school in any kind of a normal manner, just about anywhere around the globe, um, they don't seem to be drivers of the infection, at least right now. So like so with something like influenza, um, kids are really the ones who are uh, kind of the, the, the real spreaders of that. They're the ones who, who, who bring it into households and spread it to, to parents and others. Um, that doesn't seem to be happening with coronavirus that we have seen so far, but that doesn't mean it can't happen once children are on a more, you know, kind of normal schedule and back in school and, and back amongst their normal um, social networks. So that's still kind of an area where we don't have enough information to really say that kids are not a big problem in, in this outbreak. Great. Um, Another good question from uh, Lisa Bauman. Uh, WHO says true asymptomatic spread is rare, which is it? And I think there have been a lot of conflicting, you know, reports about that over, over the course of the research of this disease. So I think that's a yeah. Great question and so what what they mean by true asymptomatic spread? What we're talking about that is is people who are infected but will never show symptoms. So they're much harder to identify because you do have to do a, a lot of that mass testing on a population level and then follow them over time and test their contacts. And that is you know, difficult, it's expensive. Um, so a, a, not a lot of that is getting done anywhere to detect those really those true asymptomatics, people who will never show symptoms. So um, that's what WHO was talking about in the press conference they had. And then they kind of walked it back a day later and, and clarified a little bit that that's the population they meant. You can still have spread without symptoms though. 
Um, and that's what we're talking about with these people who are pre-symptomatic. So they will develop symptoms, they will become ill, but there's a window of time there, maybe three to four days before they develop those symptoms that they can be walking around and spreading this virus before they have symptoms. So it's still kind of an asymptomatic spread, but um, I like to divvy it up into it. You know, the true asymptomatics, as is mentioned in this, this question, versus the pre-symptomatics yeah. who will get symptoms, but they can spread that virus before they get symptoms. And so again, that's why we recommend the universal masking. Yeah, and I think there was a lot of kind of some confusing messaging about that when yes. it was first discovered. You know, I don't think people realize there was a difference between the asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic. So right. It comes to so much of this right. terminology and, and kind of, you know, you have to understand those niches and it, it gets messy. So, sure. yeah. Sure. Great. Um, a good question here from Luke uh, Parth Parthamore. <laughs> uh, many people are focused solely on the number and percentages. Can you speak to why 99% recovery doesn't equal not a concern? Um, yeah, I'm not sure quite where... Um, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe to, you know, I mean, I think some people out there have said, oh, 99 percent of people recover from this. Right. Yep. You know, is that true? And, you know, if that were the case, why should we still be concerned about? You know, right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So I will still say that that um, the, the case fatality rate for this is still in flux. Um, we're still, you know, I, I've seen 99 percent or, you know, 1 percent case fatality rates. Um, it's higher in some areas, it's lower in others. So I, I don't, I really just don't like to get into the case fatality rate at all. But one thing I also want to mention is that these people are survivors, but they're not necessarily recovered. That's one of the things we're finding out about this is that we have a good percentage of individuals and, and especially even younger people who may not be dying, but we're calling them um, these, these COVID long haulers, that they are still either sick with the virus, you know, three months later, four months later, they're still feeling fatigued, they're still feverish, they're still, you know, really unable to go about their daily life. Or in some cases, they have what may be permanent, you know, lung damage or kidney damage or something else um, that is wrong with them, including neurological issues. So I think focusing just on deaths from this doesn't really give you the whole picture, again, especially in younger people, because although they may be surviving, they may have long-term damage to, you know, to their life. So when we talk about this in public health, we talk about um, diseases that not only, you know, may, maybe have a, a low fatality rate, but they cause a lot of disability. And so that's what I think we have the potential here with, with COVID-19 is that, yes, people may survive, but they may survive with long-term effects from this. And that's something I don't think we want to discount. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing that caught me by surprise. Uh, one of our reporters uh, a couple weeks ago did a story about potential neurological damage uh, from mm -hmm. the disease, which I had not heard up until, you know, basically this month. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. a pretty frightening thing that I, I think they're still kind of doing some research on that. Oh, you yeah. I mean, as we study more survivors, we're finding more of these kind of long term sequelae that, um, you know, we, we hadn't seen before. And, and as we as we do more of these studies, I think we're only going to find more of that. So. Um, so, yeah, so I'm. I'm very concerned about even those who survive that they might not ever get back to kind of what they were before they were infected. Okay, great. Um, I'm not sure on the phrasing of this question, but I think it, it gets to a point. Um, how quickly is the state getting the results to know there is a 7% positive increase? What is the lag time for the information getting to the public? And, you know, I, I think she's talking about maybe the positivity rate of tests there, and you can probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. And, and I'm honestly not sure. So um, so I'm in public health, but I do not work for a public health department. And they're the ones that are um, dealing with all of that. So I'm not sure how long it takes them, you know, to go from, uh, you know, data they would get from hospitals or clinics to go to the public health department to go to like the ODH website. And I'm, I'm just not sure about that, because that's not something I'm involved with day to day. Sure. Well, and, and as someone who does do the numbers many days, uh, yeah. you know, I can say, I mean, and I don't know if this answers your question, Anne-Marie, but um, looking at the ODH website, which you can go to and see all the stats that we use on our web stories, you know, at any time, uh, if you go to coronavirus.ohio, if you just search for Ohio, uh, ODH, <laughs> coronavirus, you find it. Uh, but their relatively new testing chart, which they really just started putting that out uh, to the public recently, uh, it's about a three or four day lag behind today. So if you go look at that chart, it'll, it'll show the number of tests and the positivity rate from about three days ago. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, but uh, mm -hmm. I chime in on the, on the one question I might be able to answer. Yeah, awesome. Um, 
So let me continue on here. We've gotten lots and lots of new comments while we're, we're taking this system. And I'm, I'm still kind of learning this system myself, everybody. So uh, mm -hmm. thank you very much for your patience. Um, I want something. And so one, so I think we've talked about this, right? I'm not sure if we talked about it on this Facebook Live already, but um, if no herd immunity, is there any use to publish back, uh, push vaccine? Yeah, so uh, again, we don't know that there is no herd immunity, just that it would be very difficult um, to get there from natural infection, especially if the duration of immunity to a natural infection is short-lived. But with vaccines, we can manipulate all of that, right? We can pick proteins that um, may be more immunogenic and maybe longer have a longer lasting immune response. We can couple them with other proteins that we know stimulate the immune system and so make a better immune response. Um, so, you know, I, I think we have more potential for herd immunity with a vaccine than probably we do from natural infection if the, the antibody response to natural infection is short-lived, which again, those are still, those are still all open questions right now because we, we don't know the duration of, of immunity yet to a natural infection because we've only been dealing with this virus for, you know, in the U.S. really for just four months or so. Um, so those are all still open questions. Great. And so I think this is a follow-up question to something that you were speaking about earlier. Um, you know, uh, Elizabeth Ann Welsh asks, so what you're saying is that if you have trace amounts of the virus in your system weeks or months after testing positive, can you still spread it? Yeah, and we don't think so. Um, so again, those tests are, are based on, um, they amplify pieces and parts of the virus, but that virus isn't necessarily live. And so there are a few papers. It's it's tough to do studies with the live virus because it has to be done in um, a BSL-3 laboratory. So it has to have a lot of you know, restrictions and a lot of training. And there aren't that many of those in the United States. So it's a limited number of people who can work with live virus. But when they have done studies on live virus and, and kind of sampling people over time to look at when they have live virus in their system versus when they're just positive by these molecular tests, um, live virus seems to really decrease after maybe four or five days of symptoms, maybe even a little bit before that. So, you know, by the time you've been symptomatic, at, you know, a week or so, it seems that you are very unlikely to have enough virus in your system to spread it to others. Okay, And of course, there may be exceptions. That's all kind of averages, right? Um, but for those that are positive, you know, weeks or months afterwards, that is probably just, you know, again, like the dead virus that is being sloughed off in your cells um, that can be detected by these methods. But we haven't seen any evidence of transmission um, epidemiologically from these people after a long period of time that, that people have been in recovery. Great. Very good. Um, yeah, tons of tons more great, great questions coming in. And I wanted to get back to one. Um, okay. Well, this, you know, you might be able to speak to this. So... Uh, Lita Schreider asks, why don't they close everything for 21 days except our services? Wouldn't that stop it? Um, it probably wouldn't completely stop it, but I mean, it certainly would slow it down. Um, one of the problems is that even for 21 days, you would have uh, people who have been exposed before everything is shut down. And then where we see a lot of transmission happen is within households. So people bring it in to their households and spread it to to others, you know, that they live with, because um, you're probably not social distancing and, and wearing masks um, within your household for the most part. Um, but with 21 days, I mean, that would be enough time to get through some of those generations of household spread, maybe, and then um, reduce it to others in the community. So I, I think that would certainly help. And that's what we saw again with with you know the the shutdowns in March was that we did decrease spread um, during that time, but then as soon as we opened up, we, we saw spread start to increase again. So the problem is I, I think what happens after shutting everything down for 21 days, you've decreased it, but then what do you do? So um, so once you start to you know have any semblance of normalcy again, then that can just spread again from those people who are still incubating the virus. Sure, and I mean, we kind of saw the result of that, right? I mean, at Ohio, mm -hmm pretty successfully locked down uh, yeah. back in March and, and really did very significantly, you know, reduce the spread of the virus, reduce yeah. the number of positive cases, and and then... And then, <laughs> yeah. Very good, very good. Um, I think this is another really great question and something that I think 
you know, they're, they're still researching. Um, Joshua Neptune asks, is the virus, is or isn't, is uh, the virus aer aerosolized? Uh, and if so, uh, what credence do you give to the increased infection cases and, and air conditioning? I'm gonna mute myself on the dog barks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the answer to is, um, is the virus is or isn't aerosolized is yes. Um, so this is often presented as like a dichotomy. So we usually talk about the virus, um, again, as droplet spread, so that it, it um, is spread in the droplets you expel from, again, your, your mouth and nose, um, but they don't really go very far, you know, maybe six feet, maybe a little bit farther, um, but most of them will, will kind of settle out of the air in a short distance. But even with that, some of the virus probably is aerosolized, and that will increase depending on what you're doing. So um, things like singing, probably yelling, um, you know, seem to probably aerosolize the virus more than just regular talking or breathing. Um, and then, of course, some medical procedures like intubation and other things can also lead the virus to be aerosolized. And that's why healthcare workers tend to be at a higher risk than kind of your average individual. So it does seem to be possible that at least some of the virus ends up aerosolized, again, depending on some of those factors. Um, and so that may, may account for some of these super spreading events that, you know, if, if we've, we've seen outbreaks like at churches where people were, were singing or in choirs or things like that, um, that could lead the virus to spread farther and linger in the air longer and therefore infect more individuals. That seems to be relatively rare though. Um, if the virus was routinely aerosolized and that was the most common form of spread, you would expect to have a lot more people infected than we do. Um, and you would expect it to spread a lot faster. So most of what we see as far as transmission is consistent with that droplet spread, all right? Um, so to the second half, you know, as far as, as air conditioning, um, air conditioning, I think, in, in any kind of um, air flow can move the virus farther. Um, that's one thing we've seen, like in some outbreaks, like in restaurants, that people that are in the path of like air conditioning flows um, can be infected by people who are farther away because that spreads the virus over again, maybe moves those droplets farther than they would otherwise be moved. Um, but as far as like it being in the air conditioning vents and spread like that, I haven't seen a lot of good evidence that that really happens in, or at least is a, a major route of spread for this virus. Right. Um, before we go on, you know, I know I said we'd probably be wrapping up around two. If, if you do have to get out of here, I, I completely understand. I can give a few more minutes. Sorry. Few more minutes? Okay, because mm -hmm. I think there are some actually really good uh, concerns that, that people sure. have that I'd love to go to. So uh, Pete uh, Bor Borovica uh, asks, people were using Lysol on their groceries to prevent COVID-19. Um, I believe the CDC stated the virus cannot be spread on services. Is this correct? And that's a great question, one that I think is one of those things that, you know, right. as the science developed, you know, there were there were different, you know, thoughts on, on that. So I'll let you yeah. know. Yeah, I don't think they've said it can't spread on surfaces, but um, we have not really seen a lot of evidence that that's the way that people are being infected is through what we call fomites or these inanimate objects that can harbor the virus and then you, you touch those and um, and then infect yourself. So um, I would never say it, it can't spread on those surfaces, but that does not seem to be a main way that things are spread. So, you know, I still recommend, you know, washing your hands, but if, if you're going through all of these really rigorous procedures still to like disinfect all of your groceries, you know, you maybe you don't need to do that quite as much. I've never really done that. I know there was the video that went out uh, very early on in the, the pandemic about um, washing every every one of your groceries as you bring them in. I've just always unpacked things and then washed my hands afterwards. So yeah. um, guilty. So, yeah. I did that for we did that for about a week, and then uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. like, it's not realistic. <laughs> yeah, yes, and then that doesn't seem to be a huge risk. So wash your hands. Wash your hands. Yeah, great, great response. Um, this might be more of a kind of a medical question, maybe for a doctor, but maybe you can speak about it. Um, I know someone that has symptoms minus the fever, and their doctor wouldn't order the test. Should they go to a walk-in facility? And uh, you know, they, they, she said they are in a high-risk group. So thank you for the mm -hmm. question, Mabel. Yeah, and I am, am not uh, an MD. Um, so from a public health perspective, um, I would say you know this is probably a person that would want to know if they had been infected. Um, but to go to walk-in facility, I would recommend again like calling first, you know, wearing a mask, things like that, to try to minimize potential spread to other individuals. But maybe contact the facility first see if they're doing testing, see if they would be willing to test them. Because I 
you know, if I was in that group, I would, I would want to know. And we know that everybody doesn't have fever that, you know, the symptoms are so weird. Some people have fever, some will not, some will have GI um, symptoms more than the respiratory symptoms. So, um, so I think lack of fever alone is not enough to say they wouldn't be infected. Yeah. Great. Well, I am, I'm going through the comments here. Uh, you know, we got some more great questions. We got some, some really nice comments from people who, who really appreciate our reporting and mm -hmm. Some comments from people who don't so much, <laughs> as was to be expected. Um, yes. you know, the, yes. uh, simple question for Margaret, I think you probably answer this in, in a couple words. Is this an epidemic or a pandemic? Oh, um, definitions. Um, I would say both. So it, it is a pandemic. A pandemic basically means an epidemic, but in multiple regions around the globe. Okay, and, and mostly pandemic, again, has been used to refer to influenza. That's the most common types of pandemics. Um, so I think that's why it took a little bit longer for the WHO to really say, yes, this is a pandemic. Um, but an epidemic just means, you know, an increase in cases above some kind of baseline in any particular area. And we definitely have that because we've never had any cases of this novel coronavirus anywhere before. Um, so, you know, you can call this an epidemic and then it is an epidemic that is also a pandemic because it's an epidemic around the globe. Yep. Great. That answers mm -hmm. that. Well, um, you know, I think, you know, that, that has answered a lot of the common questions that we see and, uh, you know, some, some more questions that I haven't seen before. I think there were some, mm -hmm. some interesting questions there. And, you know, I think, you know, is there anything kind of you want to close out with? Any kind of closing thoughts that you want to impart to our audience, the people of Ohio and, and <laughs> the world? Right. Right. Um, I mean, you know, for this, again, I, I really think we need to get back into some of that unity and that, that, um, idea that we are facing this together that we had a, a little bit earlier in the epidemic. And I think the way to do that is to continue to do, you know, what you can um, to social distance when you can not to always go out and, and socialize with others to wash your hands, and to wear masks. I know that's really controversial right now, in some areas, but you know, I really do see it as just a way of protecting your community, protecting your neighbors, protecting those who are vulnerable. I don't think it has anything to do with fear yourself because the mask protects others more than it protects you. Um, but I mean, I guess, I guess I am a little fearful that I would, if I were incubating this, not knowing it, that I would infect somebody else and I could be responsible for somebody else's death. So I would not want to do that. That's why I, you know, obey other, um, you know, other, other public health um, recommendations. And so that's why I wear a mask and would really recommend for all of you to do so when you're out in public. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Smith, I really thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak to us and to our audience today. Um, you know, I, I do hope that we were able to, you know, that you were able to provide some good information to them and, uh, you know, clear up some confusion. Uh, Cause you know, I, I don't think, I think everybody on, on all sides and, and everybody who's mm -hmm. watching this can agree that there has been some confusion yeah. over this and, and you know, um, on the part of many people. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, at this point, as we move forward, you know, I think, you know, our, our goal is as a news agency is just to provide, you know, the, the facts and, and uh, you know, you know, as much as, you know, as much good information that we can provide about this disease and also its impact. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think one thing that we do here at News 5 is we, we do a lot of reporting, you know, maybe even more so on the actual impact of this disease and, and how mm -hmm. much, you know, how it's, you know, what it's done to our economy, what it's done to uh, the people of Ohio. So, um, you know, and you know, one thing that we try to do is, is uh, Northeast Ohio Rebound is our, our um, franchise that kind of focuses on that. And you know, but this is this is also our, our attempt to kind of you know get get more information out to our people and, and give people the chance to you know interface directly with with the experts in their fields. So um, great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Smith. I really, really do appreciate you uh, you stopping by, and uh, thank you to everyone in our Facebook audience. No matter your opinion of of myself, Dr. Smith, News Five. Uh, the media in general, um, you know, we just want to make sure that you stay safe. And, you know, I, I don't think it's a political statement to say we should be masking up right now. I think, you know, all evidence and, and everything out there is, is you know, it is a beneficial thing um, to prevent and, and slow the spread of this disease. So I, I would hope that that, would that be your kind of one takeaway? Like, you know. That would, that's, I think at this point in the pandemic, that's what we need to be concerned about right now. Try to try to slow it down and, and I would love also to be back to normal. And I think that's one way that we can get to some semblance of normality. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Thank you everyone for watching. And, uh, you know, if you have any other questions, uh, you know, please, you know, send them to us. Send, you know,
write us on on our website or, or ask us on our Facebook page. Send us a message, and uh, you know we may have Dr. Smith back someday. Um, you know to talk to us, and uh, we may be able to address this as this situation continues to develop uh, into the future. All right, stay Thanks, safe, everybody. Stay healthy and and have a have a wonderful afternoon and a wonderful weekend. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everybody.